Good morning, everyone. This is a joint hearing with the House Agriculture and Forestry Committee and the Senate Agriculture Committee. It is just uh, nine o'clock or so on April 22nd, 2021. I'm Representative Carolyn Partridge, and we are going to have testimony from our hardworking Working Lands Enterprise Board. And what I think we'll do, since not everybody knows everybody, is we will uh, introduce ourselves. Uh, we'll kick off with um, with my committee. And um, Rodney, where are you here? I've got so many faces in front of me. Uh, go yeah. ahead. Rodney Graham, Vice Chair of the House Ag and Forestry. And uh, I represent Orange One District, as to Williamstown, Washington, Orange, Corinth, Berkshire, and Chelsea. All right, I don't see Tom Bach yet. Uh, Terry, why don't you go ahead? Uh, Terry Norris, I represent towns of Benson, Orwell, Shoreham, and Whiting. All righty, Vicki. Good morning. I'm Representative Vicki Strong from Albany in the Northeast Kingdom, and I represent Albany, Barton, Crafts Ferry, Greensboro, Glover, Wheelock, and Sheffield. Thank you, Vicki. John? Good morning, everybody. I'm John O'Brien. I represent Royalton and my hometown of Tunbridge. And Heather? Good morning, all. I'm Heather Suprana, and I represent Byronard, Pomfret, Queechee, and West Hartford. And Henry? Good morning. I'm uh, Representative Henry Pearl, and I represent Cabot, Peachum, and Danville. Thank you. And I represent the towns of Athens, Brookline, Grafton, part of North Westminster, all of uh, Rockingham in my hometown of Wyndham. And now, Bobby, I'll turn it over to you um, to have your folks introduce themselves and make a couple of remarks if you'd like. Yeah, good morning, everybody. It's good to <clears throat> see you. And I want to thank you for all the hard work uh, you've been doing and will continue to do. Um, I'm Bobby Starr, and I'm from Essex, Orleans County, and I chair the Senate Committee. Is Chris on? Yep. Good morning, everybody. Happy Earth Day. Chris Pearson, Senator from Chittenden County. Hi, all. <clears throat> Anthony Polina, Washington County. Good morning, Senator Brian Collimore, representing Rutland County. Great. And do we see Corey yet? Don't think so. He'll probably join on. Corey is from Franklin County, and Tom Bach from my committee is from Chester and represents uh, Baltimore, Andover, and maybe something else, part of West Springfield. So, Bobby, did you want to say a few words? Um, no, just that, <clears throat> you know, it's more important for us, I think, to hear from, from these folks. Um, you know, I know, uh, you know, they've been busy. Uh, we try to keep the money flowing in, in their direction so they can stay busy and uh, keep our ag enterprises funded. Um, and uh, we, you know, we did do some money in the early uh, bill that we just passed, um, I think it's S315. And uh, so, uh, you know, I think we're off to a good start and, um, uh, you know, glad to hear from you and your thoughts and where we, um, might be able to help you more. Thanks, Bobby. And I uh, too wanna thank you all and I, I won't uh, take any more time. Uh, Anson, uh, I'm gonna introduce you as, you as you all probably know, I'm a little bit informal. And so I uh, use first names and if that's offensive, just let me know and we'll switch over. But um, Anson, uh, why don't you go ahead? I understand you are the uh, timekeeper and um, and you are here, right? Oh, there, you're right in the yes. center. Great. Um, and so we have quite a few people we'd like to hear from, and we want to make sure they all get fit in. So Anson, uh, go right ahead. Well, thank you all. It's great to be with you from a snowy and cold Cabot uh, this morning. Uh, the old uh, April surprise always happens every year, but we never get used to it. But uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about the Working Lands Program. I'm Anson Tebbets with the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. 
on behalf of uh, Deputy Allison Eastman and the entire team, including our director of the program, Lynn Ellen Schmoller. It's great to be with you to talk about uh, some important things uh, that are happening with the Working Lands Enterprise Board and also the partners that we have, are, which are critical to uh, leveraging support and working on the ground and making sure our, our farm and forestry sector is, is taken care of and they get the support they need. As Senator Starr mentioned, we are grateful your, for your support, your early support, I would have to say. Uh, okay. The governor did propose the $3 million uh, for the Working Lands uh, uh, Enterprise Board and, and new money this year. And we were so delighted that you folks uh, acted quickly on that. And that will help us plan over the next few weeks and months on uh, getting that money out to the uh, farm and forestry sector. So we appreciate your leadership on that and getting that $3 million that was in the governor's budget out to us earlier. We know there's more work to be done and that will come in another appropriation uh, in the coming days. So we thank you for that. We also wanna thank our farmers and producers who are on the ground, always looking for new opportunities. Uh, they're innovators uh, through this pandemic. We thank them for how they have kept us fed and safe. Um, they are working hard um, under extreme conditions, and they've done that over the last 14 months, and we thank them for their leadership as well. We have a great uh, lineup for you, and uh, we have a number of partners uh, that are with us that, that are going to help us uh, discuss some of the gaps and opportunities that are out there with financing. Uh, we're going to maybe talk a little bit about the numbers and, and have a deep dive in how uh, these uh, folks that are, you see on the screen here are helping the Working Lands Enterprise uh, Board uh, get their work done and, and using all the opportunities we can to leverage dollars through financing and uh, and, and capital. I'm going to turn it over to um, Eric DeLuca. Eric DeLuca is the vice chair of, of the Enterprise Board, and he's been with the board. Um, this is his last year. He has uh, been with the board for nine years, so he has incredible knowledge of how the board started and how it's evolved over the time and how it's grown. So I'm going to toss it with your permission, uh, Madam Chair, to Eric DeLuca. And Eric, I'll let you take it from here so we can begin this conversation with our, our partners. Thanks so much. Hanson and Carolyn and Bobby, uh, can folks hear me okay? Yeah. Great. So I'm a poster child mm -hmm. for term limits. And uh, I mean, so this will be well. my, uh, my last opportunity to do this kind of thing with you, with this board. And I'm very excited about today. This Enterprise Financing Options Committee has done great work really since it was formed in, in 2013. Um, we were with you folks in November of that year and, and came up with some blueprints for a range of tools following our research and development that came out of that panel and have piloted two of them. And um, both of the folks that did the those pilots are on this uh, panel today, so you can hear from them. Um, we have a great moderator to help us with this conversation today. Um, Janice Anange is the um, president of the Flexible Capital Fund. She was the lead author of the issue brief on access to capital for the new um, Vermont Agriculture and uh, Food System Strategy. Um, she's going to say more and introduce the panelists. And I wanted to take a second to thank all of the panelists for making time to be with us today. When we had a board meeting um, earlier, this week, uh, one of the board members said, wow, this is a real A-list group of folks and it's wonderful that they've all been uh, willing to take the time to engage in this conversation. And we really do see today as a conversation and we're starting from a position of inquiry to try to understand what works and what the challenges that face us now are and how tools, whether tools that we've used in the past or new tools that are being piloted here and elsewhere might be useful to the challenges we face today. Um, so with that, I want to hand it over to Janice, and she'll go ahead and introduce the panelists, and we'll we'll get rolling. Great, thank you so much, Eric, for the introduction. Um, as Eric had mentioned, my name is Janice Sinange. I'm the president of the Flexible Capital Fund. I'm going to first introduce our panelists um, just by name excuse me, position and organization. And then we're gonna give each panelist a chance to answer a single question. They'll have about a minute and a half to two minutes to do that. And then from there, we're gonna open it up to questions and really start the conversation going. Um, so if I, uh, as I say your name, if folks can just raise their hand so you can identify yourself. Um, First off, we have John Ramsey, who's the executive director of the Center for an Agricultural Economy. We have Lane Fury, who's the loan and outreach officer of the 
Cooperative Fund of New England, Beneth uh, Phelps, who's the director of Farmer um, Dirk Cap at Dirk Capital Partners, Joel Moyer, por uh, the portfolio manager of the Fair Food Fund, Gay Symington, president of the High Meadows Fund, Michael Phillip, chairman of Regenerative Food Network, Will Belanger, executive director of the Vermont Community Loan Fund, Sarah Isham, who's the senior agricultural loan officer at the Vermont Economic Development Authority uh, and the Vermont Ag Credit Corporation. Siobhan Smith, who's the vice president of, Vermont, of the Vermont Land Trust. And last but not least, David Lane, who's the senior vice president of Yankee Farm Credit. Did I get everybody? Hopefully. If not, speak up now or forever hold your peace, as they say. All right, well, we're gonna move on. And um, we're gonna start by giving each panelist a chance to answer this question. What's the most innovative or unique thing you're doing right now as it relates to financing food system and forest product businesses? You'll have no more than two minutes to answer the question. Uh, it's kind of like the business pitch uh, event. And then we're gonna move on to a Q&A session with the panelists and audience as we talked about. So I'm gonna actually start by modeling that two minute uh, intro. So um, the Flexible Capital Fund is a community development financial institution and an impact investor that offers an integrated capital approach to financing growing food, forestry and clean technology businesses in Vermont and the region. So we know that businesses need not only financial, but social and human capital to grow and be successful. Because of the flexibility in our own sources of capital, we can be very flexible in how we invest our money. We use a variety of different investment structures, including subordinated debt, revenue-based financing, convertible debt, and equity, depending on the needs of the companies that we're serving. We also bring instant access to our networks, expertise, yeah. and mentorship. And we're only one of a few impact investment funds in New England that offers patient equity to small rural companies that match our mission. So we're somewhat unique as an equity investor in that we invest in companies that are built to last instead of built to flip. We're partners in both the successes and failures of our portfolio companies and the community, communities they serve. And finally, as we look ahead, we want to be part of transforming our financial system from what we think is extractive to regenerative, such that our capital supports people and planet for generations to come. And as an investor that focuses on social, relational, and ecological returns as part of our mission, we recently received the designation as one of the top 25 transformative funds in the US. So, there you have it. Hopefully that was under two minutes. I'm going to um, ask each of our panelists now to answer the same question. Tell us are the most innovative or unique thing you're doing right now as it relates to financing food system and forest product businesses. And we'll start with the list that um, we, we mentioned earlier. So if John Ramsey, if you're available, if you want to start. John. He may be the only one that is not here. Let's move on then to Lane Fury of Cooperative Fund of New England. Great, I did not mean to go first, but here we are. Hi everybody, thank you, Janice. Um, my name is Lane Fury, I'm based in Barrie, Vermont and work for the Cooperative Fund of New England, which um, lends throughout the region um, to democratically owned and or cooperatively owned and democratically governed businesses that includes um, consumer owned businesses like our many, many food co-ops throughout the state, housing cooperatives, producer cooperatives and worker cooperatives. And I'm excited to share right now just about something exciting. Um, we're seeing in the worker cooperative space to support businesses that are planning for succession or retirement of a business owner to become employee owned. And I wanna share specifically about an example actually across the lake in the Adirondacks that I've been working with um, that just uh, sold Ward Lumber uh, Company, sold last month to Ward Lumber Worker Cooperative, a cooperative made up of about 40 of their 50 employees. And that conversion creates great opportunity for retention of local jobs and um, the opportunity to build community wealth and asset for those individuals who are kind of across a great range of pay scale. Um, 
And uh, that deal was about a $4 million deal. The Cooperative Fund of New England participated with um, Capital Impact Partners on a portion of that sale along with a seller note. And then there was a really key component that included um, the Empire State Development, the state agency providing a $250,000 grant as a job retention portion of that um, to support the equity buy-in. And that's because um, with democratically governed businesses, the equity piece can be a real challenge because the sale price for those individual worker owners is set not based on the, on the sale price. The equity buy-in is set based on what's an attainable and reasonable um, demonstration of commitment, as well as um, you know, making sure that everybody is going to have access, like an accessible piece. So having that state support was a really key component of making sure that there's an equity, um, adequate equity for that, for that conversion. I think that's my time for now. Great. Thank you, Lane. And that was just about two minutes. Perfect. So Beneth Phillips, or Phelps, sorry, Beneth, I know how to pronounce your name. Go ahead, Beneth. Good morning. Beneth Phelps, Dirt Capital Partners. Happy to be here today. Um, Dirt Capital Partners invest in farmland in partnership with farmers throughout the Northeast, including in Vermont. We're a technical partner for farmers around land access and transition, and we aim to support sustainable farmers with viable business models to expand through increasing their land base, thereby bringing more land under long-term sustainable business management. And the goal of Dirt Capital is to provide secure land access and to transfer ownership of the farm to a farmer over a five to 10 year period. About half the farmers we work with are first generation farmers and about half are multi-generation farms. Many of them are wholesale dairies shipping fluid milk to buyers like Organic Valley. And many of them are diversified businesses selling vegetables, meat, cheese, and value added products to consumers throughout the local and regional market channels. An objective of Dirt Capital is land access and affordability. We work to fill gaps in the financing space through affordable, highly flexible, and secure lease arrangements. We're not looking to be duplicative of other financing options. We're specifically problem solving around gaps, be it barriers to entry for young farmers or transitioning solutions for exiting farmers. We use coordinated wraparound services and staff expertise to help farmers maintain viability and extend their resource base in smart ways with Dirt Capital's participation and allowing them to grow their operations profitably through that expanded land resource base. An example of a project that we've done recently that's been innovative in Vermont is the Honeyfield Farm Transition, which some are familiar with here in Norwich, Vermont, where we worked with exiting farmers and entering farmers who were transitioning both their business and real estate to new operators after the farmers had been operating the farm there for 30 years. We view leasing with Dirt Capital or under another situation as an important step for farmers often when they're starting out as in the Honeyfield case because they build markets, they build equity, and they develop a track record and they understand what property will suit their long-term operation best. In the case of the Honeyfield transaction, we allowed young farmers who had been leasing for five years in an insecure situation to grow their business and sustainably invest for the long term by working with Dirt Capital over a 10-year lease where they'll have an option to purchase when they're ready in the middle of the lease or at the end. And we're able to work with the farmers and Working Lens Enterprise Grant to invest in the farm and get it up to snuff for their next generation of that farm's operation. Great, thank you, Beneth. Joel, Fair Food Fund. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this conversation. Um, as Janice said, I'm the portfolio manager of Fair Food Network's Impact Investment Fund, the Fair Food Fund. Um, our mission is to grow community health and wealth through the power of food. Uh, we provide patient, flexible financing and wraparound business assistance to good food entre entrepreneurs um, through our Fair Food Fund. Uh, we work in New England as well as Michigan and um, beginning to do some work in Camden, New Jersey as well. We have the flexibility to provide debt capital as well as equity or equity-like capital. We see ourselves as a collaborator with other lenders in the geographies we work. And our goal is to catalyze getting deals done for these mission-aligned enterprises that we like to work with. 
Oftentimes we provide subordinated debt or near equity with limited security. Additionally, in 2020, we launched our collateral initiative, which is a credit enhancement product that de-risks deals for other lenders by providing a guarantee of up to 25 to 30% of the loan that's being offered by the other lender. This allows entrepreneurs that otherwise might not be able to secure financing access to financing by providing this additional security to a lender. In these cases, there may be a collateral shortfall or a gap in the amount of equity that the entrepreneur is bringing to the, to the business and our collateral initiative and this credit enhancement can close that gap for the entrepreneur, allowing the, the um, lender to make the deal. Um, also, in many cases, our, with our direct lending and investing, as well as through our collateral initi initiative, we are able to provide pre and post loan business assistance to these enterprises to help ensure their long-term success um, in, in making, having high impact um, in the communities that they're working. Great, thank you, Joel. I see John Ramsey, you're, you've joined us. So I'm gonna scoop back to you. Um, we're just asking um, everyone on the panel to talk about one, something unique or uh, innovative that your organization does and keep it to under two minutes. Hi, good morning, sorry I'm late. Um, our loan program, the Vermont Farm Fund is really focused on a couple of things. One uh, is emergency loans. And so um, in times of a fire or a flood or some kind of disaster that happens on a farm, uh, we'll deploy the farm fund loan, um, emergency loan program and try to turn requests around within a week of receiving a request. Um, those loans are made at 0% interest and don't require collateral. Um, emergency loans usually top out at $10,000 and um, no payment is required in the first year of the loan. Um, so again, in times of emergency, we really try to make those funds available uh, very quickly um, to help offset um, what are often some pretty immediate challenges that, that farmers face. Um, the other loan category of the farm fund is a business builder loan category. Um, those loans are um, amortized over three years and we charge a 3% interest rate. Uh, we don't require collateral on those loans. And again, we try to turn those loan requests around fairly quickly within a week or two weeks. And again, often these loans are helping with very immediate um, needs on a farm. Um, often, you know, it's a, it's a project that comes up quickly. Um, they need access to capital, um, might be um, receiving a shipment of animals, uh, might be uh, investing in uh, some piece of infrastructure for uh, the spring uh, to get up and going for the season. And um, we often will make sure that the folks who are enrolled in the Farm Fund Loan Program are also receiving business service um, support either directly from the Center for an Agricultural Economy or um, as part of the BHCB Farm and Forest Viability Program. Um, so we try to make sure that we're bringing a technical service uh, lens to the work as well. Um, we're in the midst of rolling out a third loan program uh, directed more towards beginning um, farm and food businesses. Um, some of our loans are made to value added food businesses as well. Um, so folks who are looking to expand um, production capacity, um, need a larger piece of infrastructure or equipment um, to scale up production of a value added food product. And um, Again, these, these loans are made without collateral. Um, so th they're often able to uh, work with us very quickly. And um, in the history of the Farm Fund program, we haven't had any um, um, loans that have um, been completely in default. We have had to 
rework um, six loans in total. And um, we currently have in our, um, in our portfolio three, um, where we're allowing payments to be deferred until um, equipment is sold uh, so that the loan can be paid back. Um, John, I'm gonna yep. I'm gonna have you stop you there because sure. sorry we're over three minutes. Just want to make sure we just get again a reminder to have folks just talk about something unique or innovative with your programs, and we're gonna get into the heart of the discussion after this. So I'm gonna um, go to Gay Symington next. Hi, good morning. Good to see you, and uh, thanks for inviting High Meadows. The High Meadows Fund is a philanthropic fund uh, based at the Vermont Community Foundation. We've worked closely with the Vermont Community Foundation and having served in the legislature, I uh, find, and having worked for the nonprofit sector uh, and private sector, I find myself often thinking about what is the role of philanthropy and different forms of philanthropic capital in this continuum of you know, capital that goes to building a stronger farm and food sector and forest sector in Vermont. Uh, the High Meadows Fund has three real strategies uh, that we engage in, grant making, uh, investing, and what I call meddling, um, ideally constructive meddling, uh, often connecting meddling. Um, and uh, the example I would give, and I'm relieved that John didn't use this example because uh, he's a key partner in this, um, the example I would give is our work to support the Food Hub Collaborative, the Vermont Food Hub Collaborative, that is an L3C that is launching this year, that represents, uh, you know, several many years worth of collaborative work among four key nonprofit food hubs in Vermont. Uh, two of the key uh, hubs are the Center for an Agricultural Economy up in the Northeast Kingdom in Hardwick and Food Connects down in Brattleboro. Uh, it began in 2018 as a farm to market, as what we were calling at High Meadows, a farm to market initiative. And that initiative really grew out of what I learned by participating in a grant round with Agency of Agriculture staff, uh, by just doing a ton of listening to uh, many, many folks out in the farm and food world who felt like we could do more if we would connect uh, some of our infrastructure and really think about where are the loading docks, where are the trucks, where are the farmers? How do we connect from producer to distributor to uh, storage and, and cross docking to consumers and really understand every piece of that uh, continuum and get the information back from the market to the producers and, and providing help along the way. Um, and what, what um, pulling together, now the Food Hub Collaborative is at a place of launching uh, and it requires more capital than the High Meadows Fund or other philanthropic funds could provide. But I think the key role we played was uh, and this is what it's hard for the private sector or uh, the legislature to do, is we were providing funding when it was mushy, when it was hard to say, this is what's gonna happen because you do this. It was a connecting role. It was uh, enabling the staff of these organizations to come together to pay for some serious analysis, not just wishful thinking, which I think Vermonters are really capable of doing when it comes to the, uh, the value of, of food. So, anyway, that's a flavor of the of the role uh, and that and that particular work we've been involved in. Thank you so much, Gay. Next up is uh, Michael Phillip. Unmute myself, and I'll be ready to go. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for having us. Um, I'm Michael Phillip. I'm with the Regenerative Food Network. We're based in uh, Manchester, Dorset, down in uh, Bennington County. Um, we've been working for the last year with farm partners and food system partners to build out infrastructure in Southern Vermont related to the food system. So I'll give you one e example of how we work. Um, we, one of our partners is Studio Hill Farm, Jesse McDougall and his wife, Callie in Shaftesbury, Vermont. They grow regenerative, uh, raise regenerative sheep and uh, poultry. 
Uh, their constraint was meat processing, as we know, many of you know, is a, is a constraint not only in Vermont, but all over the Northeast. Um, so we took out a long-term lease uh, at the Adams Farm in Wilmington on a, uh, a USDA meat processing facility that they had uh, started and had uh, stopped uh, operating in 2018. Um, we invested about $100,000, $150,000 of equity from our business, which is a registered uh, benefit corporation in Delaware, um, to get the facility back up and running. Uh, it's been operating since December as a Vermont facility, uh, and uh, as, of, uh, as of Monday, has actually been operating as a full USDA facility. So that not only helps <laughs> Jesse, but will support at least, you know, five, 10, maybe more farms uh, in Southern Vermont uh, with their uh, meat processing. Off the back of that, we've, we're in the process of uh, leasing a large warehouse facility in Bennington that will be a meat, uh, you know, among other things, it'll be a distribution facility, but also a meat finishing facility that would support multiple small meat processors like the Adams Farm. And you know, that seems to be one of the best things that we can be doing for farmers here in Southern Vermont. Um, and we will, we're doing similar things in grains and small dairy in, in cooperation with other farmers. One other quick example I'll give you is working with uh, food hubs. Uh, as, as Gay mentioned, uh, we work quite closely with Food Connects. Food Connects, um, you know, is a, is their primary function is in distribution. They want to, uh, they, they want to convert over to an electric uh, delivery system. So we worked with them to get a grant uh, out of the Volkswagen settlement money. We have $225,000 coming out of that to um, get an get a electric truck for them. They have to take a diesel, an existing diesel truck out of operation to qualify for that money. And then we're, we will top that up with another seventy-five dollars to $100,000 to actually buy a new vehicle. So we try and work with partners directly to fill in gaps uh, to support the food system. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, Will Belanger. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Bobby and Carolyn. Uh, my name is Will Belanger. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Community Loan Fund. And, and uh, VCLF is a community development financial institution out of Montpelier. Uh, we provide flexible patient debt capital um, to and business assistance to those businesses and organizations that struggle to access traditional capital sources. And we uh, are lending about six to $7 million uh, annually. And one of our focuses is uh, food farms and forest uh, fund uh, that allows impact focused investors uh, to target funds to working lands enterprises. Um, and one program we launched, uh, I'll just uh, to talk about an innovative program that we launched with support from the Working Lands Enterprise Board. And it's one of the pilot um, that was mentioned earlier by Eric. Um, and it was really our uh, Sprout Deferred Payment Loan Program. Um, and it's a, it's a deferred payment, low interest revolving loan fund that can meet the capital needs of Working Lands Enterprises. Um, Sprout eligible borrowers include farms and other agricultural operations, food processors and producers, foresters, forest products, and other working lands businesses. Um, and we, we target it, it's most useful and has been targeted most frequently to start up our early stage operations with demonstrated or projected growth. So this program, this product, uh, Sprout, offers deferred, like I said, low interest loans of, of up to $60,000 at 1% for the first two years, and with then a 2% fixed rate thereafter. And then the loan fund will also coordinate comprehensive business development and financial planning and management technical assistance for borrowers as needed. So this, the impacts so, so far, the Sprout loan program is had some wonderful impacts uh, in terms of jobs and leverage. So the just about just under $165,000 over the past um, several years that we leb dollars that were uh, invested into this program has leveraged uh, almost a million dollars in VCLF capital from our impact investors, our uh, investors. Um, that million dollars in capital has been lent to 24 working lands enterprises. Um, and 21 of them have been to agriculture and three to forestry or wood uh, products enterprises. 
these enterprises have retained uh, uh, 45 jobs and project to create 24 uh, for a total job impact of 69. That equates to about $2,400, uh, 2,400 uh, working lands enterprise fund dollars uh, to job created or retained. Um, so I wanna give a, a couple of examples Will, acres. Oh, am I, am I at two minutes? Yeah, I'm sorry. You're at two, two minutes and 30. So I'm trying to keep it short so that we can get into the conversation. That's okay. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. Sarah Isham is up next. Sarah, you're muted. It's embarrassing, sorry. Um, I'm Sarah Isham and um, Vermont Economic Development Authority is governed by state statute and I think familiar to many folks on this uh, call. And our agricultural and forestry lending is done through Vermont Agricultural Credit Corporation. And we are a lender to farm and forestry businesses as well as processors of agricultural products which would include slaughterhouses, which as we know has had a pretty great need. Um, we really strive to meet some and fill some of the financing gaps. And many of our loans over the past couple of years have been to beginning farmers, which are classified as being in business for up to 10 years. Um, we use the beginning farmer program guarantees through Farm Service Agency in many cases. And we've seen a pretty strong demand for these beginning farmers to expand their businesses with oftentimes with the acquisition of additional land. And um, where traditional banks typically cannot, uh, cannot do the financing to help somebody expand if their prior business doesn't support that acquisition, we are able to, and we very often get referrals from banks and credit unions um, we work closely with other lenders, including Farm Credit and a Farm Service Agency. We did have a pilot project with Working Land Enterprise Board, um, a grant for an organic transition loan program that worked quite well as a pilot project. And so we try very hard to be nimble and able to respond if the, either the legislature or um, has a need for us to fill or if there's some other gap. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sarah, very much. Uh, next up is Siobhan from the Vermont Land Trust. Hi, thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, um, I'll try to be brief. Um, I think you guys know about the Vermont Land Trust. I'll just say that I'm gonna focus on our farmland access work and um, VLT is really committed to um, expanding our work around farm succession and transition to get the next generation of farmers successfully onto the land. Uh, toward that end, we've committed to doubling the pace of our farmland access work over the next 10 years. And we're actively developing new financing tools to provide more flexible transitions of land ownership for our partner farmers. We work primarily with new and beginning producers, um, but we also work with established farmers seeking to expand their operations and also exiting farmers seeking a successor. And for a variety of reasons, these farmers um, may be undercapitalized or lack sufficient access to low cost conventional financing. And so we're trying to fill some gaps in the system. One of the tools we've developed is our Farmland Futures Fund, which is um, really focused on um, lowering the cost of capital for VLT to step into ownership and hold properties for a longer period of time to support uh, new and beginning farmers and all these different farmers uh, growing their businesses sufficiently to be ready for ownership. So this is trying to be a more patient capital um, and using land ownership as a, as a mechanism for that. The Farmland Futures Fund uh, serves as a revolving loan fund for VLT purchases and um, we enter into you know, they're, they're variable, but we'll say on average five-year lease purchase arrangements with farmers um, to allow them, they're sort of really focused on, um, on just really trying to create the space for folks to be able to make the investments in their business and their operational growth and to take the burden of, um, of the land access, land cost off, off their plate for a period of time uh, while they do that building. 
We raised $12 million last year to support this fund, and we're continuing to seek additional contributions and investments so that we can expand um, the opportunity to, to serve more, more farmers through this strategy. Um, another important piece of this that we've um, learned over our time doing this work is the need for a capital fund. This is another component we're really focused on is raising money for a capital fund. As you probably know, many farms require significant investments to support a viable farm operation. And one of the barriers to success for, for folks often can be um, infrastructure challenges that we often, Vermont Land Trust will often undertake as part of our ownership. And we seek to resource that more fully and, and make a commitment to improving um, the quality of those farms during the, in, in advance of transition. So that's another kind of component of that. And we of course work in partnership with our farm viability network to create those wraparound support services to secure, um, create a more secure um, um, business planning um, opportunity for folks in this, um, in, the, in the process. And, and lastly, I'd say um, kind of connected to this is also our, um, uh, far, our ecosystem service work. And we're really focused on trying to bring more um, compensation to farmers for their water quality, soil health, and carbon sequestration work as another kind of component of, of these, uh, this overall support we want to bring to the, to the farm sector. Thank Great. you. Thank you so much, Yvonne. And last, but certainly not least, bring it home, David Lane. All right, thanks, Janice. Um, thanks to the committees and, and we live for uh, inviting me. Um, so Yankee Farm Credit um, is part of the National Farm Credit System. There's 63 independent associations, um, four banks and, and the funding corp. Um, but we are a cooperative. Uh, we have 1400 members um, in Vermont and we have four counties in New York. We do have two counties, I mean, two counties in New York and four counties in New Hampshire as well. We're more than a lender. Um, we actually provide financial services um, such as tax, payroll, um, uh, records. Uh, we do consulting. We have our own appraisal department. Um, and so what I think part of the innovation that we've realized in the last couple of years is that business development, successful businesses need all of those services. Um, we also offer crop insurance, uh, so risk management, uh, dairy revenue protection, and that if we can combine all of those things that the businesses need um, in one, one place, that um, we are finding you know, some high success rates. The other innovation that I'll mention is our Farm Start program. That's a partnership with Farm Credit East, another association, and CoBank, our funding bank. Um, in total, it's a commitment of seven hundred seven and a half million dollars. Um, last year, we made four investments, uh, which was a low year for us. Uh, these are up to seventy five thousand dollars. They're totally based on character um, and the really the borrower's ability to plan. Um, we also provide a mentorship with that, with those investments. Um, they're five years in length. Um, they're very flexible. They're revolving in nature. Um, one of them actually last year was to Honeyfield Farm that Beneth mentioned. Um, another was to a saffron grower, Calabash Gardens. So it's, it's an opportunity for um, people without the collateral um, to, to take on this investment. Thank you so much, Dave, for wrapping us up. Um, so I guess want to make one comment. If you, Having heard from all of our panelists, we have a wide um, range of uh, investment options for farm and f uh, forest businesses. We have um, a wide range of for-profit, non-profit, um, philanthropic organizations, um, all of which have talked about collaboration, have talked about working together, um, bring different types of investment instruments to the table, um, and all of which have a hard time thinking of one unique thing because they bring many unique things. Um, so really appreciate the opportunity to hear more about each of the organizations um, and what their, um, what their 
core offerings are to um, Vermont uh, farm and forest businesses. And so I think we're gonna move right into the next um, piece where we're gonna open it up for questions. But as the moderator, I have the prerogative to actually start with a few questions to get us going. Um, and I guess one of the things, you know, we can't ignore what has happened over the last year, year, you know, year and a couple months now with COVID-19. Um, it's really um, in many ways changed how a lot of uh, these businesses that we're funding have done business. We've seen many pivot, we've seen some go out of business. So um, I wanna ask the question, how have you, how has COVID-19 changed how you're deploying capital or change um, your perspective on what the capital needs are here in Vermont for these types of businesses. And I'm, I'm guessing we're probably not gonna get all um, 12 people uh, to answer, but um, you know, if you have a burning answer to that question, I'd love to um, perhaps raise your hand and we'll, we'll call on each of you um, to, to just talk about what's been the impact of COVID-19 and your, um, and, and your perspective. Uh, Gay, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Janice. I, I would say that um, there are a lot of <laughs> impacts of COVID-19, uh, but one of them for me that is really clear is, and it's kind of reinforced by this uh, group of people, is that until we have uh, Black, Brown, and Indigenous people at, in conversations like this, in addition to Lynn Ellen, we, are miss we have a big gap. Uh, we need to have BIPOC Vermonters participating in uh, active ways, fully engaged and with agency to talk about the gap in, in services and capital available to, if we want to have a diverse, a more diverse uh, farm and forest sector. So that to me, and I've, I've been thinking and working about on this for a while and I know all of us have programs in mind and are, wor and are working to be more open but we, we need BIPOC-led initiatives and organizations at tables like this is, is one big takeaway from last year for me. Thank you, Gay. Other thoughts from the panel? This is Will Belandre from the Vermont Community Loan Fund. And one of the things that we, we saw um, come out was um, uh, we saw a gap in small businesses, sole proprietors, uh, even and, and uh, including those from diverse communities, um, struggle with how to access um, the resources that were being made available in response to COVID, whether it was state or federal resources. Um, some had access to um, some sophisticated networks, whether they be chambers of commerce, um, but many did not, um, were not participating or did not have access to some of those networks and struggled with how to engage in state and federal, with state and federal resources, how to apply, how to um, understand and really needed assistance to make effective use of them or in too many cases, um, just abandoned pursuing those kinds of resources. And I think it, it behooves us when we start um, providing that kind of resource um, quickly and wanting to, with an incentive of trying to move money through the system quickly, that we lose people. And we need to be aware of that, that we lose people who cannot or are unable or uncertain of how to access those resources. Thank you, Will. Other thoughts from the panel? I, oh, John, I see your hand up. Thank you for raising your hand. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, I would echo what Will just said um, from our own experience uh, providing technical assistance to farm and food businesses. But I would also say that um, access to capital for um, infrastructure on farm storage and aggregation and delivery functions um, is a is a big need and an ongoing need uh, as, as many farms um, transition away from dairy into other forms of agriculture that require 
longer term storage facilities and distribution facilities um, to get their products to market. And we saw how our own infrastructure was stretched incredibly thin when coupled with all of the uh, hunger relief efforts um, that were going on as well. So I see uh, a correlation there between uh, food access and market access for, for farms and a need for um, capital infrastructure for, for those things. Thank you, John. Um, I'm actually gonna throw in um, my observation over the last year and a half. Um, we work with a lot of companies that are um, early in growth stage businesses in the food system and uh, higher up in the value chain. So primarily in manufacturing, excuse me, and distribution. Um, but my, what I have seen um, is a lot of our companies have had access um, to low cost, no cost debt through the federal programs, uh, PPP loans, EIDL loans, but many of those businesses just can't, can't even um, support that on their balance sheet. So uh, no matter how low cost the debt was, it really didn't make sense for them to take on more debt on their balance sheet. What they really needed was equity investment and equity like capital, whether it's grants or true equity. Um, and they were having challenges. Um, there are three of our portfolio companies were in the middle of an equity capital raise when COVID hit and every, um, all of those dollars dried up. Um, fortunately, some of them were able to pivot their business model and just hold steady. But even now, as they're trying to go back to the equity capital raise that they need um, to, to grow their business, they're having challenges finding investors who are willing to um, who have the wherewithal to put money into these food and forest businesses. So that's an observation that I've, I've seen. Any last observations on this question? If not, let's let's move on. I'm, I guess, um, you know, and this is a little more specific to farm transition and land financing, but um, we, you know, we're an aging state and that includes an aging entrepreneurial population. And farm transition and land financing are particularly challenging issues for Vermont. So I'd like to hear from those who work in the area of farm transition and land financing to maybe speak to this, um, this challenge. Beneth? Yeah, Janice, I, I missed a little bit of the beginning of that. Can you say more, like, can you narrow it down a little bit about- Sure, well, you know, I, 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 you've talked about what products you offer, but, um, mm -hmm. What are some of the biggest challenges to mm -hmm. farm transition and land financing that, that you're seeing? And especially, again, put it in the light of COVID because we're, we're in COVID for a while. I mean, the, the impacts of COVID will, ha will have ramifications for food and forest businesses for a long time. The biggest thing that we're seeing related to COVID is just a quickening in the real estate market, which I think, you know, a, a core thing to understand about farm transitions and farm succession planning is that when it happens well, it's a very slow process. Um, and there's sort of a probably ideal length of time that's works for everyone in terms of the new generation getting up to speed and be, being financially ready to take over and the exiting generation, you know, exiting on their own time. And um, right now we're seeing a lot of properties come on the market that are moving really quickly. And I think that's been a challenge for us and for entering farmers to um, maybe compete with non-farmer buyers um, or others who are acting in the marketplace. And I think it's meant that farmers and our conservation partners that we work with frequently are coming to us with things that they see kind of flying in and out of the market that folks have been holding on to for a long time and are now listing. And so that just speaks to the importance of conservation, I think, and of working together on these pieces to make sure that that land is available for farmers who have viable business models to work on. And that, that's really been a COVID impact that we've seen is that, that quickening of the real estate market. In terms of other challenges that we see across the board, I think um, all of the financing options here are critical to have on the table for these kind of transfer transactions to work, but I think the 
the chance of success of the transaction and everyone's happiness with it really comes down to the quality of the decision making throughout the preparing for it, the execution and the support around the actual actions and execution and around um, what happens after as that that new enterprise or new operator is trying to succeed under new conditions. And often when an operator is taking over a business, there's going to be an increase usually in the financing needed for that business or in the debt load that the business needs to support in order to continue because often a successful business that's able to transfer is going to have paid down some of their debt in their later stages. And then when they transfer a newer enterprise might have more of a mortgage or lease than they would um, later in business. And so to me, when I see people succeed, they've really done their homework in pre preparing for the transfer on both sides and they have a good support team around them. And that goes to the services that Dave talked about and that others mentioned with farm viability, um, Yankee Farm Credit Consulting. At Dirt Capital, we provide a lot of wraparound services on our transactions and try to focus on that execution, that walking farmers through the execution of those succession deals that we do all the time and try to become, I think, specialized at because we envision that farmers might do that time of transaction once in their lifetime, but we do it repeatedly. And so we try to help with the pitfalls because of that repeat execution. And so I think to the degree that we can share success stories and um, narrate around what makes these transactions successful and around how farmers should prepare and have realistic expectations on both sides, it's useful information for farmers on the ground to know that there's a lot of decision making and support that goes into making a transaction successful. It's having this capital available and flexible, but it's also how to use it, when to use it, and, the, and those pieces of information as well. Thank you, Beneth. Um, any other other organizations that focus on land acquisition and trans, farm transition want to chime in? Um, I'll just agree with, with Beneth that those are all really important points that she made and that um, it is, it is um, time consuming work and that um, sometimes, I mean, that's why sometimes VLT is able to just jump in maybe and secure a property, but the, a lot of, a lot of planning and, and work needs to go into um, finding the, the, uh, the, the farm buyer and working with someone to set up um, their business for success. Um, and, and not, and, and sometimes we, we find that we need to disappoint people um, because they might be look, interested in the property, but it's actually maybe not the right fit for them or the right choice. And we really help them kick the tires and think through the, the pros and cons of certain um, choice, certain opportunities that, that come their way. So I, I just say it's, it's complex and time consuming and important work. And um, it's great to have a, a range of partners in this space. Thank you, Siobhan. Uh, Dave, Lane? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm also gonna uh, agree with Beneth. And you know, it really is about the, the planning and you, you really can't think of just the land it, itself. You know, so a business, especially an ag or a forestry business is made up of the land, labor, um, equipment, and, and other inputs. And it's the capital that, that gets all of those. But you have to look at um, how that capital is gonna come back into the business through profits. Um, what what your debt coverage is, you know, how much can you afford to pay back if you're borrowing the capital? Um, so yeah, it, it really is about the, the planning, um, bringing together a, a strong team and making sure that, that you look at um, all of those things that you need, not, not just the land alone, but all of the other things that, that are uses of capital. Capital is just the, the medium, it's the glue that holds it all together, but um, the other pieces are what make up the business. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, it looks like we have a question from the audience. Um, really, m many of uh, us on the panel have talked about uh, infrastructure being a critical uh, component of, of the needs of these businesses. So what are the needs when addressing infrastructure with farm and food businesses? Maybe those who spoke about 
infrastructure financing can elaborate on that. So if you want to answer, please just raise your hand so I can see who's who's uh, wants to answer. No, Sarah. Yes, um, the infrastructure is so vitally important and it's something that we actually talk with the Vermont Land Trust about as well. Um, sometimes it's the housing that is a really critical need and occasionally there's a farm that doesn't have adequate housing for the farmer and that is something that we, we can really look at and in some cases we can either upgrade or we can replace um, housing that's not adequate. And then we look very closely at what the infrastructure is and whether financing might be needed in order to do some improvements. And right now that is particularly challenging because of the high cost of construction materials. So, um, you know, it really takes a lot of business planning and thinking through what are the investments that are gonna help the business be, be more profitable and sustainable and yet um, that are affordable. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Siobhan? Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, sometimes it's the like invisible infrastructure that can be the most um, important. Um, so water supplies, septic systems, um, just many of those kind of key pieces that can be very expensive and outdated and or, or, or not properly designed um, when you're getting into a new farm operation. So that's where I'll just say Vermont Land Trust has replaced many a septic and dug many a well, and those are really important um, components among other kind of housing related um, infrastructure needs. Thank you. Um, Want to dig a little bit deeper into some of the, um, the, the innovative work that is being done around uh, cooperatives. So Lane, can you talk a little bit about um, what you're seeing in the world of cooperatives, maybe go into a little more depth than what you um, mentioned in your introduction uh, and why, uh, why are cooperatives so important to the food system? Yeah, it's such a broad question. Thanks for the question. But um, because cooperatives can, it's just a structure of business ownership, but it can be applied in so many different ways. So I can start with the food cooperative system, um, the many consumer cooperatives. I was counting this morning, I think about 14 across the state. Um, and the neighboring food cooperative association provides a lot of support for the co-ops throughout the region. So they have a lot more information about the specifics of it. But um, those food co-ops are really key anchors for a lot of local farmers, local food products, um, and provide uh, a huge, huge um, outlet, retail outlet for a lot of those um, partners. So that's, I think, one of the key pieces in the, in the Vermont food system. And then as I was mentioning, I think there's a growing number of food businesses that are either starting up, establishing as uh, worker-owned cooperatives or, um, or converting to worker-owned cooperatives. And I would just kind of echo that all of the things that I heard about farm transition from um, Beneth and Siobhan um, were, are, and Dave are, are completely uh, transferable to all of those food system businesses. So we, we have a number of different food retailers um, or food producers who either have done that or are looking at that um, opportunity for transition. And that requires the same kind of um, sort of wraparound services of technical assistance, ongoing business planning, um, and patience. It can take, it take a long time. Um, and also um, uh, some of the challenges that Beneth mentioned specifically around taking on new debt, even for a successful business, that you know, adding a different kind of debt service and a need for ongoing working capital is there for any of those um, businesses that are transitioning as well. Um, but I think the real opportunity is in retaining um, local jobs for those conversions um, and um, supporting local food systems because uh, cooperatives are established, you know, by the members to fulfill a communal need or service. Um, and um, so that means that that there isn't going to be a shutdown or an acquisition that's going to um, that's going to uh, imperil those jobs or those the access to those services. I don't know if I got all the way. I don't know if there's more specifics to the question. But. Nope, that's it. Great. Thank you so much. And, and now I guess let's uh, go ahead and open it up to the audience. Feel free to use the chat 
or um, if you can raise your hand, there's a little uh, button under reactions on the bottom of your screen that will allow you to, um, so I can see you. So let's start with Representative um, Carolyn Partridge. Thanks so much, Janice. <clears throat> and I, I love the fact that Gay brought up the BIPOC community and uh, our committee actually yesterday was taking testimony regarding housing for our migrant workers. And one of the questions that came up and we are having testimony this afternoon from Gus Selig and Liz Gleason and uh, Allison Eastman uh, was the fact that sometimes the housing that is provided is uh, substandard. We know that our farmers do their best. They're also struggling in particular the dairy farmers because I think those are the folks that are mostly using uh, undocumented workers. And um, there are lots of issues around this, but the question I would have for you is, um, and I know that someone from the land trust is here, um, are there ways if farmers would like, if somehow we could work out a way to make better housing available to these undocumented workers, uh, is there a way if, for instance, uh, land is conserved, is there a way to amend that the conservation agreement or the sale of de development rights agreement in order to accommodate additional housing? This may not be the group to do that, but it, but it might, you know? And if there are folks who uh, would have some thoughts about lending to a farmer to make that uh, possible, that would, be, um, that would be interesting to me as we move forward with this conversation. Um, I'll just say that I'd be happy to talk with you about um, easement um, housing opportunities. I don't know, if, I don't wanna take up space on this panel maybe for that conversation, but I just would welcome um, Representative Partridge if you'd like to reach out to me directly or I could follow up with you. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Siobhan. Other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, Senator, I didn't see you. So go ahead. Yeah. Um, in regards, just a quick comment. To the, um, I'm glad Carolyn's having VHCB and, and, and the Ag Agency today. Uh, we, we've already talked with um, uh, Gus Selick um, about uh, they've got a we have a huge amount of money for housing, and um, Gus at VHCB is working on a plan right now to help with farm labor housing and improving uh, housing on farms because they've they've had uh, a lot of problems with housing. Uh, my other question is, I'm wondering if if you lending folks have put together any type of um, study uh, to figure out how much food can we grow in Vermont and what type of food can we grow in Vermont and utilize here? And then how much can we export to our Southern New England states and what type of products that we can export to Southern New England and, and our farmers can make a living at producing their food. Because I, someone testified earlier that uh, the income on some of these farms is very low, uh, even though they're working their butts off, uh, there's, at the end of the day, there's no money. And that doesn't work for very long. So uh, I guess I've got a lot of questions in the end and uh, was wondering, uh, and if, is there anything we as legislators can do to help uh, change that? Um, anyone wanna take that on, Gay? Gay Symington? You're on mute. There you go. My, 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 it's getting my 
finding the arrow that is the hard part. I, I know I'm on mute. I just can't get my arrow over there. <laughs> um, okay. I, I would say that there's um, that you have a lot of resources available. I would check with the folks in, at Farm to Plate um, because, the, but also the market research that was done as part of the Food Hub Collaborative was looking at some of those questions, Senator Starr, the, the size of the, where are the potential markets, where enough where uh, enough of the food dollar can get back to the producer and, and what is what are the characteristics of that food that will add value in the consumer's mind um, you know, to what they're willing to pay. Uh, and what of our perception of the, the um, mystique or a value of Vermontness really does matter to the consumer. What does it need to convey and what needs to be true about the food in order you know, to get back? Also, there is um, Ellen Kaler, again, of the Sustainable Job Zone is very active in the New England, or Janice can correct me if I'm getting the food systems work, which is kind of looking at a New England wide uh, look at what can be produced in New England, what can be, um, and where are the markets? Uh, because we are a producer state, not as much a consumer state. If we want a viable farm economy, we need folks in Boston and Hartford uh, and Pittsfield, Mass, um, you know, paying attention and purchasing Vermont food. But um, there's been a lot of research, and I think uh, Ellen could give you um, a lot of resources beyond yeah. the research, research that was done for the Food Hub Collaborative. Yes, I would just uh, I would just echo that, Senator Starr, that um, the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund and the work they're doing with New England Feeding New England, which is a, a relatively new project, um, could be of value in helping you know provide some data as well as the Farm to Plate initiative in their body of work. Uh, I'm going to move on to Senator Pearson. Thank you. Um, I've enjoyed the conversation. A lot of you have talked about filling gaps when it comes to funding and um, different loan structures, et cetera, that, that fill those gaps. But I'm curious, um, and it was came up a little bit in the chat, we have, uh, who have you thought about and who should we turn to, to help us think about gaps in the system? So the way I hear it, if, if, businesses come forward or farms come forward, you're able in many cases to, to help them out. But, but there are gaps, I would say, in our local systems where no one is looking to start a business, but we badly need it. For instance, we've talked about food aggregators. That seems like a really straightforward one to me. And of course, we have this opportunity with federal money right now and potentially some infrastructure coming in, another, another slug of federal money around infrastructure that we might be able to direct that way, which I think would be very exciting. But I'm wondering if you have ideas or, or if you have suggestions of who we could talk to uh, since your food system thinkers, many of you, to help us uh, in the next couple of years as we, we have these opportunities and we want to make them count. I'm going to open that up to the panel. Thoughts? John, go ahead. Um, Senator Weave, um, the Food Hub Collaborative have outlined infrastructure needs um, uh, for Northeast Kingdom, Central Vermont, um, Rutland County, Champlain Valley, Upper Valley, um, and we're actively working with um, several organizations in those areas to identify what those infrastructure gaps are, and we're starting to outline what that total infrastructure um, cost might might be. So happy to share more about that. Please do. Thank you. Others on the panel. Joel, go ahead. I'll just add that that I believe that you know both organizations involved with John's work are nonprofits, right? And so, Senator, I think 
you know, thinking about how to subsidize the infrastructure and the, the gaps with the federal funding is, is important because traditional venture capitalists, traditional banks aren't interested because of the risk that they perceive these food businesses have. And that's why, you know, these lenders are do the things we do because they're the traditional finance um, lenders, investors, et cetera, don't typically participate in these type of deals because of the perceived risk. So um, that thinking about how government can support subsidy and and accelerate through you know grants and or equity type money, maybe um, um, low cost debt. But as Janice said before, you know there's there's a lot of debt options already. So how can we really accelerate with different types of financing um, with government subsidy? I, I would just add to what Joel said and what's been said before that um, capital can only get you so far. Uh, and we have a lot of capital structured in, on the debt side. So uh, agree that if there was a mechanism to get more equity or equity like capital to these businesses, but also what needs to come with that is business advisory capacity and the entrepreneurs themselves who have the skill sets to execute. Um, and so we, we think of capital in this isolated bucket, but it really is part of a bigger picture of a wraparound package for an entrepreneur to be successful. So I'll leave it at that. Um, Representative John O'Brien. Thank you, Janice. Uh, I guess I have a process question, which is, um, I think the, the base budget uh, at, at the Agency of Ag for working lands is somewhere around half a million, a little above that. And then a pandemic comes along and unexpectedly, uh, we might have 10 times that in the budget um, in one time funding. And so I just wondered how, how does that money, what are the plans to get that money out into the, the, our ag and our food, food market community? And I just wondered if a lot of it works its way through some of, as Bobby said, the the lending folks here today. Eric, do you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, that, that sounds like a working lands enterprise initiative question and the folks from the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets may want to weigh in from their, their perspective um, and potentially any of the other um, agencies that play a leadership role collaboratively in the program, because it is a collaboration between three uh, state agencies and that's one of its unique strengths. Um, this panel is one of the key steps towards the response to that question. And that's why the Working Lands Enterprise Board and its Enterprise Financing Options Committee wanted to make a, a, a clear effort to engage you folks at this stage of the conversation and have these questions come up and have these various um, subject matter experts weigh in on what they're seeing in terms of what works and what's needed. Um, from here, the board will be uh, meeting in a, in a more um, in-depth strategy session than just a regular board meeting in order to look at exactly that question, looking at the, the funds that are appropriated across the different tranches um, how they may be used, um, historical uses of funds, both with our various grant channels and then across our portfolio with additional programs like Will Belanger mentioned the Sprout program um, to, to address these issues. And so we look forward to engaging with you in an ongoing manner. And this uh, conversation today is an example of the transparency and, um, and due diligence that, that the board and the initiative is committed to. Anybody else from the Agency of Ag want to make a comment? Anson, did you want to? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Yes, um, it, you know, it is an independent board, and uh, we manage it at the agency, and we have partners with the Commerce Agency and also Forest Parks and Recreation, and they're at the table with us as well. So we've had conversations uh, already about the strategy to um, use this, you know, once-in-a-lifetime money that we received uh, recently and, and the ongoing uh, support that we've had over the years. And we talk about infrastructure, a lot of it. Uh, keep in mind that what's on the table also um, uh, that's being proposed uh, by the administration will help agriculture in many ways. 
Uh, we mentioned water and sewer. Uh, there's a component um, in the in the governor's proposal that invests in water and sewer, and that could help uh, dairy processors, that could help meat processors, that could help uh, farmers, um, as the land trust has indicated. All this stuff sometimes is not that sexy, but it's the foundation. It makes it makes businesses more affordable, and sometimes it's very pricey. So this opportunity to spend dollars on uh, infrastructure, whether it be broadband, water, sewer, uh, climate change pocket is there. That's, there's an opportunity for farmers there. And you mentioned housing earlier. Uh, we've been meeting with the housing commissioner, Josh Hanford, over the summer about uh, addressing the housing issue on farms. Uh, so I think that is moving forward. Um, there's tremendous amount of money, as you mentioned, that is being dedicated to housing. And we've had discussions to make sure uh, that there's an opportunity to look at farm housing within that component. So all these things, um, are really positive and we're trying to be strategic. We're trying to be, um, you know, really focused on, we don't want to lose this opportunity. So we need to engage as many people as possible. And the folks on this panel are key, uh, key people in that. So just some thoughts overall on the, on the projects. Uh, Michael, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, just as, as someone who comes from the, you know, equity side, the private capital side of the equation. Um, what I think limits, you know, some of the private capital coming in is that they need to see, you know, an overall approach to, you know, what the food system, you know, what is the vision for the food system in Vermont and, and the region and New England? Because if it's, if it's a Vermont only solution, sometimes it's hard to bring money in from outside you know, to just look at Vermont only solutions. And, and you know, I think, you know, as, as uh, Ellen has been working and Vermont Farm to Play, I think everybody now understands that getting this food outside of Vermont is, is critical. So taking a broader approach, you know, to really say, how does the food system of Vermont fit in with the food system of New England? And what is our overall strategy, I think will attract private capital into the equation. And one of, the th one of the important things about this call and you know, one of the work we've been doing recently with Lynn Allen and, and meeting with Anson and his team has shown is that if we can bring in private capital and match it with grants and debt, so it's this whole group working together, that's really, that's what the private capital want, wants to see, that their private money is going to be leveraged with grants and with, you know, with low interest loans from both the private sector and the public sector so that there's more money overall going into the system. And I think if we take that overall approach, there is money available. There's lots of money going into the food system. You know, that if you talk about COVID related things, there's probably more money coming into the food system now than any time in the last 10 or 20 years. It's just, it's just not always coming here because sometimes people don't understand what we're trying to do. So I think we have to do a better job communicating yeah. that. Thank you, um, Michael. I, I would absolutely agree with that. Just one other point that I'll make is not only um, can we leverage private dollars if we take a collaborative approach to the grants and the and uh, all the other uh, fe federal money coming in, but we can also leverage money coming from out of Vermont into Vermont. I'll give you an example. We have a company, a food system business down in Southern Vermont, Mama Says, that what did was raising equity and we invested a small component of that equity raise because we only could do a certain amount. We brought in uh, investors from New Hampshire and from Maine to potentially participate to participate in that equity round because they saw the value of that company and what it was going to offer for all of New England. So to get a New Hampshire investor in a Vermont business when uh, it was difficult to get equity capital in Vermont at all was, um, was a, uh, a good thing. And I think we have opportunity to do more of that across New England, to bring in patient equity investors who are interested in the New England wide food and forest uh, system. Uh, Dave and then Gay. Uh Thank you, Janice. So to Senator Pearson's question, um, if, if there are missing gaps in the infrastructure, um, my first thought is that there probably are entrepreneurial or business opportunities there. 
if there's a need that's not being met. And, you know, I, I think you mentioned it, Janice, you know, this human capital piece. So what, what do you need to start a business other than capital is, is really the human capital. You need the entrepreneur. And so investing in allowing entrepreneurs to develop their plan, to bring together, which all takes time, right? But investing in entrepreneurs early to develop the plan, to bring together their potential management team, to make sure that their business model will be successful or hopefully successful. Once you have all that together, that's when you know good ideas, good management, um, a team that can execute will attract capital, be it private or, or loan capital. So think about investing early in, in the human side. Thank you, Dave. And I know we're coming up on 10.30. Uh, Lynn Ellen, is 10.30 our stop time at this point? Um, yes. It sounds like, yes, okay. Gay, I know you had a question, but I'm, I, um, Eric had mentioned he wanted to just have some closing remarks. So I think we'll have to leave it at that uh, and appreciate mm. all of the panelists. And um, thank you to mm. the legislature for having us here today. And I, I enjoy nothing more than yielding the floor to Gay. So Gay, if you want to be super brief, I want to give you a chance to get your voice in. Um, I feel free to cut me off as you need, folks. Go ahead, Gay, if you want to say something very brief. Okay. Um, well, I would just say uh, one thing I would just, I really want to stress is how important you just heard people are, the support along the way. The farm and forest viability program is key. Yes, we need infrastructure, but we need the planning, the support uh, way in advance of a farm transition and for years afterwards, entrepreneur, you know, anyway, the, that is a key element that isn't sexy. We know it works and it's just critical. Uh, and the other thing, I spoke with John Lagus the other day um, in Hardwick who milks jerseys, uh, sells to Grafton and his, co his comment to me, this is more about our mental infrastructure, is people get stuck on what a farm is. And we need to imagine farms as being, it isn't necessarily one farmer with one farm business selling to another farm business in a turnkey operation. The buyer could be many farmers working as a cooperative or a community trust, like it's the, the work that's going on at Agrarian Commons. Um, we, we need to uh, you know, expand what we think of as a farm and have sort of a variety of tools in terms of the legal structures uh, that can support that. Um, his comment was, I'm asked all the time, well, gee, this doesn't look like my grandmother's farm. And his comment was, would you want to go to your grandmother's school? Would you want to go to your grandmother's hospital? Why do we have this, you know, <laughs> this, this tight um, bucket around what we think of as a farm? Farms are changing and the face of farming is changing and we need to welcome that. It's exciting. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Gay. Um, so I'm going to be incredibly brief. Um, first, I just want to thank all of the legislators who've made time to be with us today and also um, <clears throat> the board and the committee and the panelists for sharing their, their time and wisdom and just want to, you know, it was great to hear Anson's follow up on the question that came in and it just highlights how this program is unique in terms of both being a partnership across multiple state agencies and a public-private partnership and a partnership across the agriculture, food, forest, and wood product sectors. Um, the four things I'm gonna say incredibly briefly are uh, just reflections on things that I heard in the conversation that I wanted to highlight. Um, first of all, in terms of um, engaging black, indigenous, and people of color entrepreneurs and businesses that um, finding and centering, highlighting and partnering actively with networks um, that come from and support and have the trust of those communities, I think is a way to ensure that uh, when these things happen, they happen in the way that reflects the needs of the BIPOC entrepreneurs and businesses and entities. Um, the Farm Start program that Dave Lane mentioned was 
cited in the research and development that led to the Sprout program that, uh, that Will noted came out of the, the work that this board did and now has been piloted across uh, two or three tranches of funding. So I think you can see those synergies across time and my hope is that today can be a springboard to other future success stories just like Sprout was informed by and made an effort not to duplicate Farm Start. Um, these lease to own in the farm transferring um, landscape for financing is, is really important because we, we did a panel on this with the farm to plate financing cross cutting team. And what we learned was that that on ramp for the incoming entrepreneur, the incoming farmer is a key success factor. And so both with Vermont Land Trust and Dirt Capital Partners and others trying to create that holding environment so that the, that the incoming farmer is set up for success, I think is a key point I wanted to highlight. And lastly, the idea of access and the role of um, bringing the farm, the food access, access to be able to eat piece of it with the farm viability and business um, success part of it is really key. And I just wanted to mention briefly the Everyone Eats program because just to realize that that's a program that was piloted by a private business, the Skinny Pancake, and then was able to work with partners across the state and the legislature and, and federal funding to make it available to a wide variety of folks so that people who were impacted by COVID could eat, restaurants that were impacted by COVID could work and be paid and, and create food, and then food could be grown in state um, and then and, and made all the way through to accessible to eaters. Um, so with that, I just want to thank everybody again, and I'm happy to hand it off to um, Bobby and Carolyn to close us out. Thank you again for your time. <clears throat> yep. Eric, thank you very much. We really appreciate all of your time. Um, I think this has been really helpful. And um, I, I, I just have one housekeeping question. And Linda, do we ha does the house stay on this call and move into our break and then further work, or do we leave? You stay. Okay. You stay and we leave. Yes. Okay. Zoom etiquette. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. And thanks a lot, uh, panelists, for being with us. Very interesting. Got some good points. And, uh, you know, if you have any other comments you'd like to send to us, uh, feel certainly free uh, to do that. And uh, hopefully uh, working together, we'll, we'll accomplish something. So thanks again. Yeah, thank you all.